So in no particular order, I'm going to begin by introducing Representative Teresa Alonso Leon, who is the first indigenous Latina immigrant elected to Oregon's legislature. She is the daughter of migrant farm workers and after receiving her master's in public administration and serving on Oregon's Higher Education Coordinating Commission, she was elected to the State House in 2016. She represents House District 22 and she is also the chair of the House Education Committee and is also a member of the House Healthcare Committee. She believes access to education and healthcare are human rights and equity must be at the center of this work. And next we have Felicita Monteblanco, who earned her bachelor's degree from the University of San Francisco. She was elected to the board of directors for the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District in 2017. And she hosts quarterly gatherings for Latinx leaders in Washington County. She was recognized for her service to the community with the American Association of University Women Breaking Barriers Award in 2019. That same year, she also had the opportunity to travel to China as part of the American Council for Young Political Leaders, whose aim is to provide a global perspective to local elections. She has held positions in local nonprofits, and in her free time, Felicita loves to dance, travel, and canvas for candidates that she believes in. Following this, we have Olivia Alcaire, who has been serving on the Hillsborough City Council since 2017. She's the executive director of CREATE, an alternative school located in Forest Grove. Olivia has certainly, or Olivia has her bachelor's of arts and master's of arts in Mexican history from PSU, a master's of ed in adult education from OSU, and is currently working on her doctor of education in educational leadership at Portland State. She has 20 plus years in social service work and has completed two AmeriCorps visa volunteer programs. She serves on the board of Bienestar of Oregon and Willamette West Habitat for Humanity, who each provide affordable housing. She cares about affordable housing, immigrant rights, the environment, and natural resource conversation, conversation, public safety, and so much more. Most of all, Olivia supports younger waves of BIPOC who are also interested in becoming future leaders. Next, raised in Bandon, Oregon by a single father in a low-income household, Winsby Campos, who brings life experiences that many in her community can relate to, but which remain sidelined and devalued in the political world. As a child and as the proud daughter of immigrants, Winsby learned the importance and power of representation. This drove her to attend Pacific University where she earned a bachelor's of arts degree in political science and also in philosophy, law, ethics, and society. She currently works as a case manager for Family Promise of Beaverton. Following this, we have Mariana Valenzuela Figueroa. She was born in La Serena, Chile, and has lived in the state of Oregon since 2001. She received her Master's of Business Administration from Pacific University, as well as a Bachelor's of Arts in Latin American Studies and a Master's of Arts in Literature from New Mexico State University. Her professional career includes 27 years of teaching experiences at institutions of higher education, including Idaho State University, PCC, and Pacific University. Currently, she holds the position of Director of Community Partnerships and Advocacy at Centro Cultural, where she has worked on civic engagement projects and community outreach since August of 2018. Ms. Valenzuela is a member of the Latino Policy Council and is also the City Councilor for the City of Forest Grove. We then have Erica Lopez, who is a longtime Washington County resident and community volunteer. In June of 2017, she was elected as a board member to the Hillsborough School District, a district where she was a former student. She is an advocate for equity in public education, student engagement, and community outreach. In January of 2019, she was voted by her peers to serve on the Oregon School Board Association. It is there that she also serves in the Color Caucus, which advocates for the unique needs of students of color. Most recently, she has served and was nominated again this past June to continue her role as the chair of the Hillsborough School District Board. Currently, she is also a project manager in the Community Development Department for the City of Hillsborough. And so now we're going to hear from some of these lovely ladies that I've just finished introducing. 
And so I want to begin by asking Olivia, it seems like you've done it all. And so I think we're curious to know who or what were your greatest influences in your decision to pursue your career? Um, <clears throat> you know, all my life, um, studied history and it wasn't until college when I understood what, um, Latino contributions were made to our country and, um, understanding what that meant. And, um, so I have to say that what happened, I never was thinking about um, getting into politics. I was contacted by um, Hector Hinojosa and Cecilia Giron at the time when um, Olga Acuna was gonna step down. Um, she finished out her term on city council. And at that time, I've been working also in higher education since 2003. And at that moment I was at um, PCC I had already been working for years with helping undocumented students get into college, get scholarships, get into first year success programs, and helping them move along. And um, so when I understood what was happening at the time, that what was going to happen with our election and the fights for Sanctuary City, then I thought carefully about um, what Cecilia and Hector were asking me to do. And so I wrote a letter. And um, like 22 other people, and I got selected. And my first vote was for Sanctuary City. And I think um, having been working with youth and families for so long, for me, it was breaking my heart watching um, what people were experiencing. I'm also on the board of Bienestar, which is an affordable housing um, program, nonprofit program that provides farm worker and low-income housing from Cornelius all the way to Forest Grove. And that, at the same time, too, I was really concerned about what was going to be happening with our families. And um, so those are the things that weighed on me more. But when I talked in my letter to the council, I expressed an interest for what I see about Hillsboro, what I appreciate about parks and amenities, and um, that I have an affordable home and I am close to Shoot Park and a lot of other things that people could really benefit from. And, um, and I think that, you know, there were other things too, thinking about roads and transportation and economics and, you know, jobs, um, all those things, I packed it into my letter and um, I still look back on it and I still reflect that those are the things that I continue to care about. And um, so as a city councilor, I've been able to participate in um, Latinx small business and working with our police department to try to solve relations there. I meet community members who are facing challenges um, um, after having gone, been the victim of crimes and helping them move through that process and um, even going on to try to get citizenship. And um, so there's a lot of things that are happening and I, I'm, I'm glad that I made the choice to write that letter because I wasn't thinking about it before. But I've been part of a lot of critical conversations with council and I feel like if I wasn't there, there wouldn't be consideration for families that need affordable housing or at poverty level um, for undocumented and what that means when you don't have protections, especially right now during COVID and, and a slew of other things. Um, so I, um, I'll stop there, but that is why I got involved. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, so for our next question, I'm going to be asking Felicita, how has your identity as a Latina shaped some of your policy work? Thank you, Carmen. Um, so one thing I want to make super clear, especially to the college students that are on this call, is that your lived experience brings perspective um, and it is a value. <laughs> um, please take that away if you take away nothing else. Um, I don't care how old you are, um, your experience with college debt, your experience trying to find an affordable apartment, your experience of waiting for an hour for a bus to take you to school, that all can shape um, your future legislative work, your future work on uh, county council. Um, uh, so to me, just please keep that in mind. Um, 
And as you know, the majority of folks that have been in charge for a long, long time are wealthy, white, male, cis, hetero. We need new perspectives. We need new lived experiences to be at those tables shaping policy. And, you know, of course, allies are important um, and our, our allies are critical to the work that we do. It makes our work a lot easier, um, but nothing makes up for lived experience. So please, please know that. Um, so the pr perspectives that I have are that my father's an immigrant from Peru. Um, I, um, my cousins and I are the first of um, our generation to be born in this country. Um, I have undocumented people in my life that I love. Um, I, um, and I'm of, of the audacious idea that everyone has value in our community. <laughs> um, that's certainly not what everyone believes these days. Um, I'm the daughter of a cleaning lady. I have a di uh, diverse um, family. Um, I had to pay for college. Um, all the things, um, all these things shape my, how I write policy, the things that I notice, um, the things that cause red flags when I hear staff talk about. Um, so a few things I wanted to share about the parks district that I've worked on, um, and just real quickly, Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, it's the largest park special district in the state, um, serving about 250,000 people. Um, I'm the first Latina on that board, and currently um, we have two women of color on the board, which is really exciting. And I can also say that the majority of my peers are really strong allies to get this work done. So it doesn't always have to me being like, hello, racial equity, <laughs> um, which is exhausting. Um, so just as one example, you know, something that I notice is that we as a park district, we're putting up barriers for our undocumented community to volunteer. Um, I want everyone who wants to volunteer with the district to be able to. Um, I don't want to put any, uh, I don't want folks to have to jump through hoops just to engage with the district. Um, this caused a deeper conversation around um, who needs background checks to engage. You know, if, if you're volunteering for a cleanup day, no, you don't need a background check. If you are volunteering with kiddos on a basketball team, yep, that is important. And what is the actual um, identification materials that you need um, to do that background check? So it was really, it was a really long process, but I'm really glad we did it. And it caused a lot of great conversations and reflection. And I'm happy to say that we've eliminated a lot of those barriers for our undocumented community to engage as volunteers in the district. Um, I'll also highlight our affordable housing work. I've worked on this project for over three plus years. It gets very wonky and in the weeds. If it's something you're interested in, let me know. I love talking about it. Um, it would just take two hours to explain it. Um, and it actually all came to culmination last night um, where we finally got to vote for essentially waivers for our affordable housing um, development community uh, to um, to waive these, uh, these charges um, to make affordable housing um, more uh to build more affordable housing in beaverton and i think it's funny because a lot of people are just like gosh you're so radical like just stick with parks but the reality is the parks district is shaping the socioeconomic um diversity of the region so we absolutely have to have these conversations and i think the fact that it was the daughter of an immigrant a Latina, a girl who had to pay for college, a girl who's always worked in a nonprofit job, you know, that shaped how I saw this issue and how I fought for this issue and how I won on this issue. <laughs> um, so I guess that's what I'll highlight. Thanks, Carmen. <laughs> yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, is there anything that any of the other panelists would like to add to these first two questions that have been asked? Well, if not, I can chime in a little bit. And I would say, I think that the, one of the questions that um, I think was asked of Olivia, what is it that kind of pushed you, uh, influenced your decision to run for office? And I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the 2016 election and what that really did for our community and how it really kind of catapulted a lot of us into that space where before we weren't maybe as, um, you know, comfortable stepping up and stepping out and, um, you know, making sure our voices were heard. But if we didn't do that, other people are creating the narrative about who we are and what we contribute to our community. And it's unacceptable for that to be, um, for that narrative to be completely wrong, to not value our communities and to paint us in a way as criminals or, you know, worse things and and we are not and so for me i think that's really what 
kind of pushed me into that space is saying like, if somebody's going to tell the story about who I am in my community, then it better be me and not somebody else. Um, <clears throat> and the other part was just having my children. So I have two kids and um, my, I always tell the story because it was, this is kind of like the biggest reason, but when my son was in school and he was in recess, um, one of one of the kids in school told him like, if Trump wins, you know, they're going to send your mom to Mexico. And that narrative of like him thinking like, mom, if that happens, like you're going to be sent to Mexico. And I had to explain to him like, you know, immigration and like what that is and all of these things that he really didn't, he was like nine. He really didn't have any reason to be worried about anything like that. And, but there are families and kids in our community, I told them that this is a real fear and this is really um, a big deal. And so that was one of the reasons where I decided to try to make an impact somewhere and children and especially, you know, having my kids in the school district and figuring out how do we make our district be aware of the challenges that many of our families face and how do we ensure that we're creating some resources, some infrastructure to support a lot of our families in our community that are dealing with some of these issues. But I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you for adding that. You guys are giving us some really, really important points. So next up, if anybody else doesn't want to share anything, I am going to take the time to ask Winsby, what has been your proudest accomplishment so far in your political journey? So that is a question that I've put a lot of thought into because um, there are moments like, you know, election night that I could say, you know, really proud of. Uh, but I think it's actually something that happened really recently. Um, and I'll give a little bit of background to it. Um, about a month or so ago, I was in in like a panel or somewhere that I had a few minutes to speak. And I found myself apologizing. And after I got off of the call, I was sitting and I was thinking, why do I do that all of the time? I, I have a tendency to undercut myself to, um, or to undermine myself and be in the middle of saying something, you know, that is important or valuable. And I'm given this time and this space. And yet I stop and I say, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Or uh, I'm sorry, like I've been talking for a while or those kind of things. And so I had to take a moment of reflection and realize that it's something that I've internalized over the years, because as, as was mentioned, you know, the, these spaces uh, are so often uh, folks where people, you know, people like me um, don't exist, they're not prevalent. Um, these are spaces that have been taken up by white men, by those who are wealthy. And so I thought about how over the years, uh, I have, I have been made to think, you know, that that I don't belong in these in these spaces, and that my voice isn't important. And so, just the other day, I was on another panel, and I was talking to uh, I was talking to high school students. And so, I was given about ten minutes to speak, which is a long time. And yes, there is a piece of it where it does feel kind of strange to just keep talking and talking, um, but. Um, I got to a point where I started to, where I felt that, like I'd been talking for a while and I started to get nervous. And so I started to say, um, I feel like I've gotten on, on a soapbox and I stopped and I said, and I was about to apologize, but I'm not going to because this, this is a space where young people belong in, where women belong in, where communities of color should exist in. And we, you know, uh, we need to be taking that space. And so it was actually a moment that I was really proud of because it, it, I'm, it's something that I'm still working on, right? I'm still working on uh, being okay with, uh, with being vocal, with sharing my opinions in spaces where, um, where there aren't others who look like me. And, and specifically, I will say that when I when I paused for that moment before I was about to apologize, I thought to myself, I am not about to apologize to these students and make it and continue to normalize um, and to you know let the, to have them see.
see that that I'm apologizing to them because particularly um, as somebody who is young, you know, I, I have that imposter syndrome when when uh, uh, folks who are in politics sometimes lean uh, lean older. And so I thought to myself, you know, I'm not I'm not going to normalize this in front of these students because they should feel empowered. So that is, I think, something that I'm I'm really proud of. I think that's an experience that um, a lot of people can relate to. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's extremely validating. Does anybody um, want to jump in on that? If not, I can jump over to Mariana for her question. And so Mariana, who are you invested in and who is invested in? All right, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I feel very humbled to be here among all of you and these amazing women. Um, and I also thank you for this question because it gave me the opportunity to take a deep breath and reflect on the journey that I have traveled and that has brought me to where I am today. Um, First and foremost, I am deeply invested in my family, particularly my kids, Christine and Pablo. And those of you who are my friends and know me well, you understand what I mean by that. Like truly, truly invested in my kids. Uh, well, my young adults, um, accomplished young adults. Uh, both of them graduated from Pacific University, uh, both graduated with a degree in politics and government. And this journey was not easy. I was the only parent at home since my son was eight and my daughter was 11. And as everything, you know, in life, there were challenges, uh, emotional and financial challenges, but also many, many blessings. And they are now independent. They don't need an allowance anymore. And they themselves are very invested in their careers and their communities, relationships, and of course, uh, their mother and, and their family. Um, I am also invested in my community, uh, not only my nearby community, but people in general, um, though the issues that I see and uh, that I can contribute, if I find a way that I can contribute to make things uh, better, I certainly uh, step in. And this aspect of my life uh, reflects through my job at Centro Cultural, which has given me so many opportunities to grow professionally, uh, to use the skills that were kind of dormant and develop new community engagement and advocacy skills. I spent 27 years teaching prior to going to Centro and uh, I have met so many students, hundreds of them. I love working with young people, uh, who are beginning their journey towards a career in independence. Uh, they have so much energy and joy, and uh, I will always uh, be a teacher at heart. I am also deeply invested in my role as a city councilor in Forest Grove. This has been truly an amazing uh, to be able to see the city from a different perspective, understand the challenges, how to address them, how to solve conflicts and compromise. So um, this leads me to the second part of the question uh, by stating that uh, Centro Cultural is invested in me. Um, I am a counselor for the city of Forest Grove because I was at Centro. And an amazing young millennial named Juan Carlos Gonzalez mentioned that I should apply to the city council position in Forest Grove. And my executive director, uh, Maria Caballero Rubio, suggested I apply as well. I had not thought about politics ever until that point. Um, so the question I'm going to, um, for the students who are listening, um, what does it mean that someone is invested in you? Basically it means they believe in you and your potential. They pay attention to you and uh, to understand who you are. And most of the time they see traits that we do not see in ourselves. Self-awareness can be difficult uh, to develop. They open doors for you, hold the beacon for you with confidence and trust so that you can develop professionally and overall as a human being. I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to be part of this panel um, and to listen to all of you, your, these amazing women. Thank you. 
Yeah, what a beautiful answer to a beautiful question. I'm interested um, in seeing what some of the other panelists think of the same question. Who are you invested in and who's invested in you? Does anybody want to? Oh, yes. I'll just jump in and share that. The, the number of uh, elected leaders of color in, at least in Washington County is pretty s small. Like it's getting bigger, which is so freaking exciting. And it's about to get even bigger real soon. <laughs> and it makes me very, very happy. Um, but I guess I just want to share, because I think it's important that people know this, that as an example, I would say Erica and I are very invested in one another and we support one another emotionally and professionally and we cheer each other on and we think through things together when we're struggling and we lift each other up. Nothing brings me more joy than telling everybody how amazing Erica is. I sort of get mad when people are like, do you know Erica Lopez? I'm like, yeah, of course I know Erica Lopez. <laughs> um, and so I guess I just want to share that like we all support each other in various ways. Like we all know each other on this panel because these are amazing leaders in the community who are doing great work and we lift each other up and we challenge each other when we need to. Um, but that's how we get this work done. And that's what makes us better. I'd like to add a couple things, if you don't mind, Carmen. Um, you know, one of the things that I find really powerful is when you know your own self-worth, you're going to invest in yourself. And, and by that means um, when opportunities to develop your skills, you take them, you participate. Um, I wanna share with you, um, Narse, when I worked um, with her at PCC, um, I uh, learned of a National Hispana Leadership Institute where they um, accepted only 22 women across the country to participate in a year long program. And this took me through, um, uh, Harvard's Leadership Institute. It took me through DC, and, and I got to I got to meet like the highest ranking Latina women in Washington DC under the Obama administration in 2009. When I learned of this opportunity, I went to Narse and asked her, um, you know, is this uh, opportunity available to me? And you know, can I apply? And, and will the institution support me? And without a doubt, she absolutely said, let's, let's try it and see a ver que pasa. You know, having mentors and having people who believe in you also um, is important to acknowledge. Um, so for me, to all the young people uh, participating, y, todo, y nosotros los grandes too, right? It's, it's important to continue to invest in yourself through um, skill building because you never know when that opportunity will come where you get to lean in and participate in a leadership position. Um, like all of us, all of us, right? We never, um, it sounds like not, none, none of us ever planned on or thought about running for, for an elected position, but it turned out that way. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge the self-investment that I think is important and acknowledging uh, opportunities for other women so they can also um, you know, lean in and participate in, in, in self-learning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, so Teresa, I mean, I guess this is a pretty easy segue into your question, but what advice do you have for college students who want to embark in running for office, for those who plan on it? Because it seems like it's a common theme that a lot of you guys that get into politics, it kind of happens unexpectedly. Yeah, um, thank you, Carmen, for that question. So let me just give you a little bit of history, um, just to give you some background in Oregon politics. Um, Oregon was admitted into the Union as a 33rd state in 1859, but it wasn't until 1914 that we had our first woman, um, Marion B. Taney, to serve on the Oregon legislature. And it wasn't until the 80s that we had our first, um, oh, but in, uh, in the 70s where we had our first uh, person of color um, represent us uh, at the legislature, Bill McCoy. And then fast forward, it wasn't until 1985 that we had our first woman of color run for office um, and, and be part of our legislature, uh, Margaret Lu Louise Carter. And then fast forward some more, it wasn't until 1996 that we had our first Latina legislator and that was Susan Castillo. 
So think about this. <laughs> um, we haven't had many, and, and this, um, of course, I'm not mentioning all the other legislators of color, but it's taken us this long to even have you know, the representation that we have now. In 2016, we, um, you know, we won a, a pretty much a, um, an amazing, uh, we had amazing wins in 2016. Um, and by 2017, we had the most, uh, I would say, diverse legislative body in the history of our state. We, we now have nine legislators of color. Um, uh, and, and I'm happy about that, but oh, that's a beginning. <laughs> that is a start. And that means that we need to have young people who um, aspire to run for office or, or lead in uh, local elected and appointed positions. So anybody here who's interested in doing that, I would say do it. Um, you know, if you if you believe you have the skill sets and, and if you believe um, in your values and you believe that representation isn't happening in your community, then, you know, do it. Um, I would say that some people might want to start um, and, you know, as as I would say staffers, if that's something you want to learn about politics. Um, maybe you want to become a chief of staff at the legislature. Maybe you want to become a second LA at the legislature. Um, maybe you want to become somebody's campaign manager or field director to get a sense of the work. Um, but those uh, others who feel like, you know, they have the courage to run for city council or school board or um, state, you know, state office, I would say go for it. Um, sometimes the experience is more valuable. The journey of the experience is more valuable than actually winning because you get to then um, take that experience when you do lose your, your um, campaign to try it out later on, but now you have the experience. Glad or none of us would like, like to lose, <laughs> but um, we all wanna win our campaigns, but I think it's important um, to just share that a uh, little bit of background for, for folks. There's so many opportunities that people can, in, can get involved with in, um, in politics. Um, many of you may know that um, there's the Oregon Student Association. They are, you know, very much represented at the Capitol. But saben que I've also realized that they that um, not all students even know about the um, student association, the Oregon Student Association, um, and not all students know about how to get involved um, at the Capitol or how to get their voices heard. Um, similarly to what some of the panelists have mentioned, it's really important to help educate folks because these systems are not accessible. Um, you know, these systems are not made for everybody, but by having representation um, and having diverse people run for um, elected and appointed seats, we get to have those voices in there and we get to start reframing are restructuring some of the systems that have, um, you know, caused a lot of pain or caused inaccessibility for many of our communities. So I would say absolutely, if you're interested in, in running for office, um, appointed elected uh, positions locally or at the state level, um, it's very important for you to say, of course, I can too. If they could, I can too. Uh, we often wait to be invited, um, pero saben que? If you feel strongly enough, don't wait for somebody to invite you. Traite otra silla, bring another chair, and be part of that conversation. Gracias. Gracias, gracias. So, um, does anybody want to add anything to that? So, I actually want to add a few things to that. Um, so I had the opportunity to work on Erica Lopez's campaign while I was still in, uh, in school when I was still going to Pacific University. I, it was the first campaign I managed and uh, had a fantastic candidate that I worked with. Um, and 
Uh, I think there are a number of different ways that you can get involved and take those steps. You really, if you do have, uh, you know, an outlook of wanting to run for elected office, um, I know that there are a number of different clubs at Pacific University that engage with the political process, but you can also get involved with your county party. I was involved with my county party for about five years uh, and ended up doing that through getting involved with one of the clubs at Pacific, and they had connections through that. Um, and everything just sort of kind of led to one another. Um, and because uh, actually, I think I had gone to, I was working, I was volunteering with my county party uh, when, and they were part of the people that brought folks to a school board meeting, uh, which later led to me wanting to work on those school board races, which meant, which led to me meeting uh, the amazing uh, and incomparable Erica Lopez and, and then later Felicita. Uh, so definitely get involved in whatever ways you can at the, lo at the local level, but also know your community. Um, and, oh, actually, hold on one second. I will be right back. So, so I have this piece of paper that I have up on my uh, cork board. <laughs> Um, that, uh, so if you are looking to run for office, there are a few things that I think, you know, are really important. Um, know who you are, know where you're coming from and who you fight for, and to know why you're running, why you're passionate about doing so. Um, and the last thing I will say, uh, is there are times, um, I've heard this for others, but I've definitely heard this while I've been on the campaign trail. Um, I've heard a few criticisms of, of myself come through the grapevine, and one of them is that I am too ambitious. And I have heard from folks who, uh, you know, who have set out, who have those goals to someday run for office, it's specifically um, that they have been called too ambitious. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with having ambition. So do not ever let anybody tell you that. And uh, that's the last thing that I'll say on that. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so um, now for our last question for this round, I'm going to be asking Miss Erica, as an elected official, what have been some of the challenges you have faced and how have you overcame them? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great. First of all, I just want to acknowledge all of our panelists because I'm always inspired when I listen to you all. Um, it just makes me feel like um, I'm not alone. And it, it, it is very, one of the challenges is that it's very lonely right now. As Teresa um, acknowledged, you know, we have a long way to go to ensure that we have representation and that we have different voices at the table. And right now it's not like that. So I would say one of the biggest challenges, is it does get lonely a little bit um, when you're the only person of color on your board or on your council, or it just seems like you're always the one that's like raising these issues and like, where is everybody out? Why is nobody talking about this? That can be a little exhausting. And, and part of that challenge, um, I think for me, when I realized that is, and also realizing that I'm only one vote out of seven, is that I knew that I needed to make, um, I needed to bring my board along this journey of racial equity. And I needed to build relationships with these other members who some of them I probably don't have anything in common with or have same life experiences or anything like that, but I needed to ensure and able for them to, you know, make the changes and work on the work that I wanted to work on that they needed to be invested and um, understand the specific needs of our community and of our people. And so part of it is doing a lot of work in that relationship building and a lot of diplomacy, a lot of those hard conversations, a lot of meeting even just one-on-one -on -one to have coffee, nothing related to our board work, but to, for that person to, you know, see the, the, the dehumanization that happens a lot to our people and people of color but really to see me as a person and see my community as contributing members, we have to break down a lot of those um, kind of barriers that exist. So that's a huge challenge, I would say, when you get into those spaces and you see that 
there's not a lot of people that look like you or that come from your same background. So there's an uphill battle of having to make them see and understand um, your, your, you know, your community and your experience from the white dominant community. Um, so that's definitely one of the, the biggest challenges. But as Felicita mentioned, leaning on each other and really calling sometimes when it gets really difficult and when I'm just like crying and like, you know, trying to deal with a lot of the stuff that I have to deal with and having those people in your community that you can lean, you know, lean on and that can help you be strategic, that can help you, you know, work on some of those issues and figure out how do, how do we get this done? Um, I think that is something that we are all really blessed with in this space um, to know each other. Um, the other thing that I would say um, is challenging is, especially for me as a parent, um, is managing a lot of these priorities that I have in my life. So trying to be effective, trying to manage these relationships, are my board work, also being on the state board, and then a lot of things, a lot of times what happens is because we don't have a lot of representation right now, you get asked to be in so many different spaces. And so that balance has to um, also, I think, if you know what, you, what your value system is and what is it that you're trying to accomplish, it gets easier to say no to the things that are really not aligned with what you're doing. Because everybody's going to want to ask you to participate in this or do that. But if you are, are focused and you say, okay, well, is this going to get me to where I need to be, then you can start um, kind of sifting all those things out. So managing your time and, and the different roles in your life is gonna be a challenge and making sure that you take care of yourself, um, that you are always ensuring that, like that as I mentioned, that you're investing in yourself, whether it's just learning and um, you know sharpening some of those skills, but also to taking care of yourself emotionally and mentally because it is, um, it's a lot of weight right now. And so the, the challenge that I have or the call to action for all of you that are on this call is if nobody has told you that you need to run for office, I'm telling you right now that you need to run for office because there's no other, there's no other space where we have this ability to make such impactful change in our community than, than we do in this space. And oftentimes, if you look at your leadership, look at your city council, look at your school board districts, look at your, you know, the water board who sets our fees for our water. If none of those people are advocating for our communities or, or even have a different life experience that can understand, they're not going to be making decisions that, that um, impact us, you know, to our benefit. So I am the fire department, you know, there's fire, uh, parks, water, all of those different committees or boards all politics is local politics. So don't think that you need to be, you know, a senator or something to be impactful. You can be impactful in your community right here, right now. And there's no minimum requirements of, of education or of income or anything like that. You just have to have the desire to want to, you know, volunteer your time and serve. So I just want to make sure that I acknowledge and, and make that call um, for you all because I feel like when I started kind of, I got, like I mentioned, we never really planned on it and you just kind of get pushed into the space because things just kind of align. But if, in looking back, if I could have been more um, proactive and planned, I would have started serving as much as possible in different committees because you get to start learning a little bit of how do the conversations go? How do the meetings run? What's my expectation? What is my role? you get to start to get a sense for all of those things. I've always been a volunteer, um, but I never really got into the more like formalized volunteer, like in boards and committees. I would definitely um, say that's, that is an area where you can start sharpening your skills and you can start learning, networking and building up your resume so that when you get ready to jump on the next, you know, maybe you go from a board member to be a city councilor or then to be a state rep or whatever it is that you want, the trajectory that you have, you know, your resume kind of built out for you and you have that experience uh, to take on. So I think I'll leave it at that. Oh, I, I did want to mention one other thing that is a, a huge challenge, especially because I think a lot of us can resonate, but all of these meetings and all of these spaces are all very, you know, from a white dominant culture. And that's not really how I've learned to interact in the world, in my family or in my community, it is very different. 
And so that is always just a huge challenge to say, just because we've done things a certain way doesn't mean we need to continue doing things a certain way. I don't ask our, our family um, groups, especially our Latinx families in our district, like, please come and talk to me at my board meeting. I go and talk to you at your meeting that you have. I go meet with you in your spaces. And that's something that I've pushed all of my board also to say, we go to them. We don't ask them to come to us because that's the like normal for, you know, politics and people in positions of power. It's like hold town halls and you guys come and see me. And, you know, that's something that for me, it's like, we have to rewrite that. We have to go to our people where they are. And, and stop that. <laughs> like, I just, that's something that is a challenge. And then you're just going to have to continue to do things your own way and differently. And, you know, even when it comes to like raising money and campaigns, I always say like, there's nothing wrong with selling tamales and raising funds for your campaign. Like you can do anything that you want and anything that's different. You don't have to, you know, do what everybody else traditionally has done because we're not, you know, we're different and it, it could be different. Well, um, so that has ended our portion of these questions, but before I hand it off to Narse, I just want to say how grateful I am to get the opportunity to hear all of these beautiful and wonderful experiences and narratives, and you guys are indeed Mujeres Poderosas. And so with that, I will hand it off now to Narse. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you for um, um, helping us out as a student. We're really proud of you. We're really proud of uh, what um, life will bring to you as a political science major. And please know that you have all these amazing mujeres that are now your madrinas. So, uh, uh, and, you know, pass the information along to your peers as well. And uh, as you can see by, by many of them, you know, it's, it's been a journey. Um, of amazing, amazing work that they are doing, that they will be doing, and um, and they're paving the way for themselves many times. It, it is, it can be a very lonely um, situation. So uh, thank you, Carmen. I, I know you probably have to get to class. Uh, so uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and um, open up the floor for uh, questions. But before I do that, uh, I am really inspired by all of you, and there's some, um, I love palabras, I love narratives, and um, I got goosebumps, and there was so much pride because, like my dad says, esto no es de todo lo, como dice San Matias, esto no se ve todos los días, by having you all be present here for the non-Spanish speakers, what that means, I'm Catholic, so it's saying something like, you know, St. Matthews or something, St. Matias. This is a pleasure for me in particular because you don't get to see a panel of Latina Mujeres Poderosas uh, every day or in one single space. So uh, for that, I'm very, very proud. Some of the things that I, um, that I want to acknowledge and I want to take a moment um, that, I, that I, I learned from all of you today is that you are making history and you're making history for our community. And for that, I thank you. You're making history for our world. You're making history for our county. Um, you are courageous, valientes, poderosas, fregonas. You know, you just keep on doing it and I love it. Um, radical, there's nothing wrong with being radical. Thank you, Felicita. Just, you know, it's, um, it's okay to be a radical and a metiche and keep asking those questions. Um, and you step in and you step out. And you know, I picked up from all of you that when you step in and you step out, you know that you that we are. Um, it's that um, that all of those complications that come with um, with code switching all the time, right? Right now, you don't have to code switch. You are in a space where you can be who you are. But if you know what I mean by code switching, you it, it it's exhausting. So today is a day que te quita la máscara. You take off your mask and you're in this space, and that's not an everyday thing. Somebody said it, um, I just wanna say that we exist. We exist um, and, uh, and we belong. And we will not be up unapologetic. Unapologetic, no se vale, no se vale. 
So without further ado, we're going to do questions. Y viva la mujer. So, preguntas. Um, you can do that. Uh, Jennifer, can you uh, tell us how we can do that so the audience knows? Yeah, so audience members, you're free to raise your hand in the participant area. There should be an area where you can raise your hand or you can turn on your videos and chime in. Narce loves seeing everyone's faces in the little square. So you're welcome to turn, in, turn on your videos at any time. Any, uh, do we have uh, any questions, any thoughts, uh, gratitude? Please don't be shy. Uh, so I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. It's amazing. Uh, shout out to Felicita for the invite to this. This is so great. And Erica, she totally like talked you up and it like, it's amazing. You're amazing. Oh my gosh. And with, was they was I'm so sorry. Uh, Camp, how, how do you pronounce your name again? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, I wanted to make sure that was right. Um, I loved your talk about like we're here to take up space and we should not apologize for that at all. Like you were doing that and I was getting goosebumps. I was like, oh my gosh, speaking to my soul. So thank you everyone for sharing your stories. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Narsa, uh, if I can uh, plug in um, yes. that Woodburn has uh, Capaces Leadership Institute for any Latina women who want to learn and understand um, uh, the political sphere, whether you want to um, you know, learn how to campaign or you just want to understand, like, what does it mean to run for a, um, a, a position or an appointed position? Like, what does that mean? So I just want to plug in uh, Capaces Leadership Institute. They're the only um, I think probably leadership training program in the entire state that really um, works on helping Latinos um, gain some skills or learn to understand how to navigate the political sphere. So just want to plug them in in case we have people who are interested and you guys can Google them and um, learn about their workshops and opportunities. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, I have a, a question uh, from Rosie. Rosie Fiala, who works here, amazing amiga uh, to me. So to the panelists um, and whoever would like to answer this, who were your role models growing up? ¿Quién te dio esa fuerza? I'll chime in because I already have an answer for this one. Um, it's definitely my mother and my grandmother. I think that in my family, you know, and I think in our culture, we're very matriarchal. And so there's always been strong females in my life. Um, and my grandmother still to the, I just talked to her this morning, actually. So that's why she's like in my mind right now, but they're definitely like this, um, people that always believed in giving back to their community and were always volunteering, whether it be in church or in school or whatever. I always saw them as that's like an intrinsic part of their lives is making sure that they were giving back. Um, and they really just had they like felicita stated they believe that everyone in our community have value and so that's who i that my biggest inspiration thank you alguien más nancy can i say something of course nancy is this nancy, <laughs> is this nancy from hillsborough yeah hillsborough chamber Andale. um I'm saddened that I only got in around 12 and I didn't get to hear the better half of this as well. Um, so I'm certain it was great too. I want to just appreciate these ladies. I, you know, there's a, it's a generational panel that we see here and the fact that these women are spot on about our experiences and that we can hear that and that their stories are just so impressive and that in the leadership that the role that they have, that they are doing so much service for our community that we continuously see marginalized. So I just want to thank you ladies for standing up for our communities. And also the other part that I wanted to mention, 
that I'm so humbled about, and I'm going to get emotional about it, sorry. I love that I could just, I could feel how connected we are in this space. And I'm in so many professional circles, and that rarely happens. Um, So to me, that says words about the impact that we create in our community, our professional lives, and at home. I always remember, you know, I love to hear that we're so connected to our family because when I'm out doing the work that I'm doing, I'm thinking about my parents' plight to this country and the work they've done with their lives and that every person I'm helping is for a better cause, right? So again, I just love to hear that we're still connected to our history, to our families, and that we're here to create a difference for our communities moving forward. And again, I appreciate that that feeling of just like, you know, feeling that you are in the place you need to be. And that doesn't often happen for us women that are women of color, Latinas in these spaces. So again, thank you very much. And we should do this more often because Mujeres Poderosas just doesn't has, uh, happen on Hispanic Heritage Month. It needs to happen more often. Let's get it. All right, Nancy, gracias. Uh, And thank you, Nancy, for those of you that may or may not know Nancy. Nancy is a powerhouse in Washington County in particular in Hillsboro. Um, She's been doing amazing work with the uh, Latinx Chamber of Commerce and she is everywhere in every circle. Well, right now in Zoom, no la veo, I don't see her very often, but um, she's everywhere. I went to the Pulga, the flea market the other day to get a tamal and there she was, you know, just welcoming our community and being there in space. So somebody and many of us need to convince Nancy to run for office. So watch out Nancy, porque we're not going to leave you alone now. Nancy, uh-huh. I'll be following up. I didn't know about you, but Narsa, thank you for creating this space. Yeah, we need to please share Nancy's uh, contact info so we can have conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I will. Yeah, she's, she's a powerhouse in our county. Uh, we have a, a question uh, uh, from Leslie uh, Palotas. It says, does anyone have advice to share about how they deal with the first time they stepped into to participate in a committee or council space. Are there any tips on how we can make uh, that process easier for people who don't see others who look like uh, them already at the table? Arce, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, So I got appointed. And so that means that city council in Hillsboro um, agreed that I should be serving on council. And when I arrived there, Um, we weren't speaking the same language. I came from higher education where I had expectations of social justice, DEI trainings, and that people were aware of the issues that were impacting um, people, and in particular, college students. But over time, and this was 2017, and over time, what I can tell you today is that we trust each other on council. They, I feel like they listen to what I have to say as the only person of color. I bring people to council that normally they would not see. That includes bringing three people who were um, houseless so that they could explain how when we make decisions about a bus stop, about an um, about initiative that we're going to do, how is that going to affect the people that need that? And, and, and uh, in particular, like when we say we want to bring companies and create jobs, well, what kind of jobs are those? And how are people gonna get to there? The other thing is that I, um, I can't speak for everybody in my community. I can't speak for all the communities in Hillsboro. But what I can do is I can invite them to come and talk and I can invite them to come and present. So for example, um, yes, there's a lot of leadership programs and that as uh, you mentioned um, in Woodburn, but when I brought Bienestar Promotores, they got to share with council what their leadership experience was like and why they reach out to the community. That's not something that I can speak for them. And so it is something that council needed to hear. And to be able to understand that there are different ways that leadership can happen, but they need to be inclusive of those differences too when we're thinking about community service. And, um, I mean, there's somebody on council who we have always been way on the opposite ends, but that is the person that I have the best conversations with. And so um, for me, 
I needed to establish trust with everybody and them with me to get to really good conversations so that we can find consensus on things that would benefit our city and the people who are living there. Um, so that was important to me and I have no regrets. I have a lot of respect for the people that I get to serve with. And it's been a pleasure to get to work with them. And even the guy who we're on opposite ends, I'm gonna miss him when he's not on council anymore because who else will I have those conversations um, about difference in a depth like that? So it took growing for me. It took growing in the way that I had to develop communication with them to understand them because before that, I didn't hang around six white men who were professionals from all these different areas. That wasn't my experience. But um, we know each other now. And so if all of you are listening here and thinking about doing leadership and going into um, a space like that, running for an office, you will get to know those people and you should get to understand how they work, what they think about, what do they appreciate. And then you engage them and get to know them and you're sharing yourself. And um, that was something that I had to learn, but I am so grateful that I took those steps to get there. Olivia, thank you for that, um, for, for that insight. Actually, there's a question that just came in um, privately that it actually aligns with closely to what you are saying. And the question is, um, you know, how do you make an impact? And you talked about this when you have to create uh, allies and can you give some guidance, uh, or any of you, on how to connect with uh, those that do not share our personal values? I want to add to that, too, that it's something that I've seen as a common denominator, um, having worked with many of you panelists in different capacities or seeing the work that you've done, is that we don't have the luxury to be uncomfortable ourselves. We just jump in and we have to do the work, but we also are not in the field of making others comfortable. We are in the field of challenging. And, uh, and that's one thing that I get asked quite often is a, is, a, is a Mexicana, is a Latinx female. It's like, are you sure you're gonna be okay walking into this space with all these white people? I'm like, uh, the question is, are they gonna be okay with me? And how are we gonna develop that relationship? So what can you add to that? Um, because that's, that's a survival thing. Como le hacemos, como le hacen? I was just gonna say that one of the, I think one of the things that I realized, and, and this was just not in the political sphere, but just in the professional sphere of, you know, doing just my regular work and job, I realized that, you know, Oregon is really white still. And many of the people that are here, especially uh, white Oregonians, have never really interacted with a person of color outside of what they see on TV or what is given to them in stuff. So a lot of times what happens is that's the perception that they have of who we are is whatever they read on a newspaper or seen on a TV or something. They've never actually had an interaction or a conversation with somebody that looks different from them. And a lot of times, I think in the beginning, I was just like, uh, some of the questions that they would ask or some of the things that they would think, I would be like, where did, oh, you've never actually like talked to someone that is different. And it's just so interesting once they um, you kind of understand that perspective that they, you know, we've always had to live in their world, but they've never had to live in ours. And so whenever they had to like have that interaction, it's like the first time. And it just, I think the more that we, we don't code switch anymore, the more that we show up our true selves all the time and who we are and just represent who, who we are and have them like not to say, have them, you know, acomodarse a nosotros instead of like ours the other way around. You know, we show that we don't have to hide who we are. We don't have to hide um, our culture or anything like that. We just show up complete and whole and then let them see that and start humanizing uh, ourselves and our people versus whatever narrative they grew up knowing or, or listening to. Um, and I think it starts to kind of peel back those those layers of like, oh, you're just another person, you know, like, yes, I am just a human being just like you. I just have different customs or different cultures and they're beautiful and wonderful. And I would, you know, share those things, but it is, it is definitely a challenge and you have to, um, I, I say we always kind of are a little bit guarded in that way, but for elected officials, it's like, you know, nobody can fire you. 
elected officials, you're there, you've been elected, you show up and you take up that space and have your voice be heard and your presence be felt there. Thank you, Erica. We have uh, time for one more question. Um, so I want to be respectful of people's time. So um, it says, you know, uh, we're getting gratitude. Uh, stories are very uplifting. And uh, there's some curiosity in regards to, you know, have any of you stepped in into these leadership positions, but it but hit a uh, stalemate related to moving forward issues, um, policies. Does it does it ever feel like you're you aren't making progress? I'm going to just do a half a minute here. Every day, there are so many roadblockers. It's like playing, it's like being in a box ring. But you know what? My, when I wake up every morning uh, and there's all kinds of challenges that are going on and you know, we, I think we all face them, the simple fact that we are present and we're in the role that we are in and that you're all in, it's making progress because one of the things to keep in mind that um, those policies that need to be changed um, are not always, we're not very flashy people all the time. So we do a lot of work por debajito, por debajito. So anybody else wants to answer that question? And I, I'm just gonna quickly add. So one, one of the things um, that we often get asked as elected officials is about money and like, how do you make this work? And so that question hasn't been asked yet. And, it, and I'll just highlight that um, in, Previously, the parks district was getting park district elected officials were getting paid fifty dollars a month, and I immediately said, "Like, hey, that's a barrier. This is a big commitment. Let's talk about making this a little bit more accessible to folks um, because it's a lot of meetings and it's hours and hours of meetings." So I brought it to my peers. I had one board member call me a moral. I had another board member tell me um, that they made it work. So why can't I? Um, and it's not. It wasn't about me. It was about the next Latina on the board. It was about the working mom that I want to join our board, right? Um, and so I, I, I want to be mindful that some pancakes you just can't flip, and it's only worth so much energy. Um, and so I, anyone who's followed my political career knows that I um, recruited other women to run for political office for these certain positions and I flipped the board. And now we can have much more productive conversations about these things. And we, she, they don't just automatically agree with me, that's not democracy, but we can ha actually have the conversation because things like access matter to me. And if it doesn't matter to you, I don't know how many more conversations I have to have with you before you think so. And at some point it's not worth my time anymore. Thank you, Felicita. I wish we, we could, we can go on for another hour. Um, and I think that um, I like what Nancy said, we need to be able to provide more space, you know, to be able to uh, have these conversations, which is, you know, uh, salud uh, para todas nosotras, for all of us. So um, I want to thank you all again for being in this space. It certainly made my day. And I certainly was inspired and learned a lot from you. And, and thank you again for being courageous and for stepping up to the plate to be able to flip the pancakes that uh, need to be, that needs to take place. So muchisimas gracias um, uh, to our panelists and to uh, those of you that attended. Teresa, I'll go ahead and send you uh, Nancy um, Lopez information and um, Pacific University will uh, uh, US mail you a, a gift of gratitude on behalf of Pacific University with some swag because we, you know, we, I can't, no se los puedo entregar, I can't give it to you right now. Pero de todo corazón, muchas gracias. Thank you everybody for being here. And without further ado, I, we will be closing the panel. Besitos y abrazos y bendiciones. Gracias. Chao. Un abrazo virtual a todas. Sí. Thank you, Narce. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias, Narce. <laughs> Bye, hermanas.